Hey there, and welcome back to RimWorld. My name is Pete, and today we complete another episode of our RimWorld adventure in the tropical rainforest with the Believers of Boyo. Last time we left off, after what was an eventful episode, we were hit by an enemy raid, malaria, the plague, and hostile animals. Unfortunately though, we also ran into some bugs, and I asked you guys for help on those. And what can I say, once again the community delivered. So, the good news first, thanks to your feedback and some more tests on my end, I was quickly able to figure out the problem. The bad news, the problem was installing the biotech DLC into an already ongoing save file, which left me with the rather daunting task of transferring all the contents from the active save file into a new save file, while preserving everything from pawns to animals to the base to the worlds to the factions in it, which took me pretty much an entire weekend to accomplish. The end result is still not perfect, but I'd wager that you would be hard pressed to find any differences, because what you can see at the moment is in fact that new save file, and as you can see, everything does look pretty much identical to how it was when we left off last time. I think I'll spare you the technical rundown of everything I had to do to accomplish this, eventually I might decide to do another video on that alone. One small change I do want to mention at this point is the Arconexus questline. Unfortunately I was not able to entirely replicate all the details of this quest. So now we are no longer aiming to obtain the second part of the map from two hostile factions, instead we will have to deal only with wild people, which does unfortunately also remove the alliance requirement, which I had always felt was a nice extra challenge on top of acquiring all that wealth. So if you happen to know of any way to alter the factions who actually give you this quest, then let me know. Otherwise, I don't think it will be the end of the world if we continue with the quest as it is right now. With that being said, let's jump into the gameplay with a rare medical mishap from Kevin. Yes, I have decided that it's time to get our bear population under control. So at the moment, we are in the process of sterilizing all of them. And it looks like Kevin here was not quite careful enough with poor Darker. To make matters even worse, he also suffers food poisoning shortly after. Looks to me like I did not set up all the right food restrictions just yet. And well, in that state he should probably not be operating on any further animals. Unfortunately though he is, with expectable results. This time Grizzly Bear Hexner is suffering the consequences and what consequences they are. Yes, Kevin actually just cut off the animal's right paw and that is definitely not where he was supposed to cut. So I think we'll give Kevin a bit of a break and instead we'll have Squeaks construct another sarcophagus as a leftover from last episode's prison break, which has actually spawned one of the most hilarious bits of fan art I have ever seen, more on that at the end of the video. We can now bury the body of Zeknath, which means we now have two filled sarcophagi in our common room, and that means the meditation focus strength of all meditation spots connected to them has been increased by a meager 2 points, from 20 up to 22%. Now at this point we also want to make use of Kevin's council feature for the first time. As you can see, Took here is still not over Squix's rejection, so let's have Kevin counsel him with a moderate success chance, and indeed Took now receives a corresponding plus 18 mood bonus that will last for the next 24 days. We might very soon also do this with Squix, who is still mourning the loss of some of her grizzly bears. The mood penalty from that lasts even longer than this, although it is a bit smaller. In terms of research then, one more thing I need to mention. It was unfortunately not possible to transfer our current state of research progress into the new save file, so we have to start electricity all the way back from the beginning here. However, to make up for that I have set research speed to 500% for the time being, just until we have caught up with where we were last time. In the middle of the night then, things get a bit dramatic with Kevin. The poor mood from his food poisoning causes him to have a complete mental breakdown, and so he has now entered a catatonic state. In that state he will remain basically unconscious and it can last for up to 5 days. Well, let's see how much time our speaker of sacrifice needs. Perhaps a bit of company from one of our crashed refugees can cheer him up. We'll have to see how the situation develops. In the meantime, Took angers another rhinoceros on his hunting trip, and so we quickly call in reinforcements. Lights with his medium psychic slug psychast, which I have actually come to enjoy quite a bit, and of course Wyatt with his trusty plasma sword Redhawk. And as you can see, the rhinoceros is no match for that, even though Wyatt does suffer a small injury. Now once again calling upon our backup doctor Squigs, who as always does her best to patch up the rhinoceros bite on his left hand. All of a sudden though, the situation goes from moderately bad to much much worse, as our small colony of Red Chapel is now getting besieged. 20 enemy pirates have dropped in and as you can see with formidable weaponry, and they will now begin to set up their siege equipment, and in just a few moments I expect mortar shells will be flying. 
Now, obviously, we do not want to take on this group head-on, but I do have a plan, and it involves lights and a doomsday rocket launcher. Once equipped, he will briefly meditate a bit more until his psi focus has surpassed 50%. That is important, because below that threshold we cannot cast the invisibility psi cast, and that will be what hopefully wins us this fight easily. In the meantime, our enemies are setting up their fortifications, two mortars are being constructed, and just a few moments later the first shell is flying and lands directly on top of our bears. Still, the majority of our base is of course safe, being constructed underneath the mountain, and thankfully it is also raining at the moment, so the fire does not concern us too much. Still, I would say it's high time that we stop this, so it's a good thing that Light has already reached his destination. At this point, we can then quickly turn him invisible, skip him in a little bit closer, and calmly release the full barrage of a Doomsday rocket launcher right in the middle of our enemies. Now, unfortunately, despite causing quite a bit of carnage, this does not cause our enemies to flee. So I think it's time to skip Light back to the base, where we have already set up a small ambush behind our cave entrance. I had hoped that this would have been enough to lure some enemies into Wyatt's melee striking range. Unfortunately though, as you can see, it was not, and so the shooting begins. This setup will definitely have to be optimized in the near future. For now, we can once again use light psychic slugs to back us up. If you're wondering, by the way, yes, this is a psychast from the Combat Psychast mod, something I installed back when we played with the Cult of Jinx, just because I felt that as powerful as light is as a psychaster, he's lacking a bit in direct firepower, and this mod aims to fix that, and I think it does do a serviceable job. As always, you can find the full mod list in the description below, but in the meantime, our enemies have called for the retreat, the absolute menace that is light just a bit too much for them today. Took Squix and Wyatt meanwhile take care of a few more of the attackers, making sure that as many of them pay for the sins that they have committed. I think in the case of enemy raids like this, the believers of Boyo would not shy away from a bit of extra violence, especially not against something so elaborate as a siege. On the following morning then, a flash storm strikes the jungle, but as long as it's still raining, I think we can live with that. The problem arises when it's not, as fires can spread extremely quickly here. The enemy corpses then halt neatly over to the side to serve as food for our bears, while we grab a hold of anything that might still be useful. In this case, that would be mostly marine and recon armors, which are always useful as emergency options even if they're tainted. The flash storm, meanwhile, has caused a little bit of a problem. As you can see, a sizable part of the map is already on fire. I think we'll have to keep an eye on how that develops. Our crash refugee from the Empire, meanwhile, has made a full recovery and unfortunately has decided to leave now. And he has picked one of the worst possible moments to do so, as a psychic wave has just turned several rhinos insane, three of them to be exact, coming in from multiple directions. Before we worry about our guest though, we have to take care of Took, who was just out hunting, and who we are now skipping back into safety. Just as he arrives, so does the first rhino, but the firepower of three pawns combined with Wyatt's melee aptitude make quick work of it. The other two, meanwhile, are unfortunately coming in together, so we are stunning the second one, which gives us plenty of time to take care of the first, and once again it is Wyatt who plays an important role here. That now leaves only one more, and well, we have done this twice before, so no surprises with the outcome here, this honestly went smoother than I had expected. With our meat supply secured, we are then also informed that our other crashed refugee has made a full recovery. Eventually, we can see them both exit the map more or less together. We do not get any rewards for that at this point, but don't worry, that is intended. With these two, I still have to manually add the ideology development points, which now sit at 5. For all further quests of this kind, they will be automatically assigned though, just the way they should be. The day then comes to an end with a bit more construction. As you can see, we are slightly increasing the capacity of our storage room. And we are also digging out another small room in the middle between hospital and storage. This one will eventually serve as a small makeshift prison. The fire from earlier, meanwhile, is actually also still active and has already decimated a good chunk of the map. Thankfully though, we do have a river on the map which should keep it on the right side of our base. On the next morning then, we have rain setting in, and with that the fire is of no more concern. 
The day itself remains mostly uneventful and is spent mostly with food production, that is, until Kevin awakens from his catatonic state in the early afternoon. Still, he somehow manages to fail yet another sterilization procedure. Let's hope that this does not become a regular thing for him. Otherwise, though, the day remains mostly uneventful until in the evening we can notice another fire has started, and this one is in fact burning on the dangerous side of the river. But thankfully, once again at night, the rain sets in, and with that, the danger soon passes. On the following morning, then, we have a lone visitor wander in. A good opportunity to have Kevin do some trading, but it's nothing overly exciting. We are just selling some salvaged weapons to get a hold of what little silver the trader has. With the construction of a sturdy granite door, our small prison cell is then also completed. Eventually, of course, we will construct something a bit more elaborate. For now, though, I think this will suffice. And just like that, another evening rolls around and I was almost ready to jump ahead to the next morning. But it seems like Took has something to say about that, as he once again goes on one of his food binges. So I guess it's a good thing that we have plenty of meals in storage. On the next morning, then, we receive an interesting quest, a quest that I think we will accept, as we are tasked with attacking an enemy settlement. A settlement quite heavily protected, not only by people, but by eight turrets and a mortar as well. But I think I have an idea on how to handle this. First of all, though, let us quickly construct two bedrolls, and then we will accept the quest for the Siling Neuroformer. This will allow a pawn of our choosing to unlock psychic abilities or to level up their already existing ones, which to me actually seems more modest than accepting a masterwork meditation throne. Not to mention that we have used psychic abilities for stuff like Word of Joy, so I think this does fit in with the overall charitable direction we are taking. Either way, the quest location is thankfully not too far away, and so we quickly assemble a caravan consisting of Wyatt and Light, who will ride into this one on the backs of Loras and the Earl of Bronze, and who should hopefully not need much more than just a few simple meals as provisions. As they get ready to leave, the Silent Neuroformer then arrives immediately, and at this point you can already let me know who you think we should give it to. Both Took and Squigs do not have any psychic abilities at all yet, while Kevin is still sitting at level 1. But of course, we also have Ellie as a potential candidate down the line, not to mention Brandon who joined us last time and who's still with the Empire at the moment. Our small adventuring party then makes it off the map as we harvest our very first batch of chocolate, so in the future our patients will be well taken care of. A few moments later then, a sudden interruption during Tuk's hunting trip. Our caravan is being ambushed and they are asking for the orbital bombardment targeter that I stupidly left on light. And of course, as charitable as we are, we're not just going to hand that over. So now we'll have to fight two Neanderthals. This xenotype is characterized by being very good in a fight, in particular a melee fight. They are aggressive, deal strong melee damage, are robust and feel reduced pain. However, they are also slow runners and in this particular instance both naked, which kind of helps with the fact that I forgot to re-equip Light's assault rifle. So the first enemy here goes down to his psychic slugs, while the second one is briefly stunned by Wyatt and then engaged in melee combat. I'd have to say the odds are very much in our favor here, especially after the enemy gets lit on fire. This is a lovely side effect of Wyatt carrying a plasma sword. Yes, it can also cause absolute chaos in the worst possible moments, but in small-scale skirmishes like this one it gives us a huge advantage. And so the attackers are quickly defeated and the caravan can continue on its way. Although not for long it seems, as just a few hours later we are attacked by animals. So I would say let's take care of four man-hunting hares. This obviously a task for Wyatt and Wyatt alone. As you can see, one hit is enough to kill each animal, and still one of them does manage to sneak in a nasty bite, but luckily it's nothing serious and we have it patched up in no time. Back home meanwhile, Took has gone on yet another food binge. Yes, it looks like things can never go too well in the jungle. Still, while our resident cook is picking out on food, an eclipse sets in. And a few short moments later, Took simply collapses. Seems to me like in between all the eating, he simply forgot to sleep, so now he's got a long night ahead of him to take care of that. Due to all the interruptions, our small caravan then unfortunately also takes all the way until the next morning to arrive at their destination. Taking a closer look at the enemy base, we can see nothing out of the ordinary. Just two enemies for now, as well as a whole lot of turrets, but those I think we should be able to handle. So, first things first, let's get our animals as well as light into safety. I think Wyatt should be able to take care of this mostly by himself, and that is thanks to his rather convenient smoke pop sidecast. 
Having such a smoke cloud between a turret and its target will cause the turret to completely lose track and we can use that to our advantage to get him up close and personal with the first turret immediately. His shield belt is then also enough to take care of a few stray shots from another one, and a boar is then also no match for a man who kills elephants and rhinos in his spare time, and even the turret's explosion here is thankfully blocked by the shield belt. At this point then we have more boar coming in, but killing the first one already causes our enemies to flee, at least some of them, it does seem like we are dealing with two separate groups here, and well, as we know, Wyatt is not one to show mercy anyway. With another quick smoke pop we can then start bashing in the next turret, while Light finds himself in a firefight against someone carrying a smoke launcher, so we could just sit and wait this one out, but this smoke launcher should actually come in handy, so let's quickly take this enemy out while Wyatt does the same with the last one over on his side of the battlefield. And with that, the area is now clear of hostiles, the only thing left are turrets, and well, I think I'll cut right to the chase. With Light now carrying a smoke launcher, Wyatt's smoke pop sidecast is no longer needed, and so together the two of them can work themselves from turret to turret, eventually reaching the last one, and with that the base is cleared. Or at least it would be if one of our earlier enemies had not gotten back up on his feet. Thankfully though, just as the eclipse comes to an end, so does his resolve, and so we are now finally able to reform our caravan. And well, for a comparatively easy mission, we are leaving with quite the haul here. At least in terms of technology, this mission definitely puts us a good step ahead of the curve, as we are recovering a grand total of four batteries, a mini turret and a mortar, together with mortar shells. Good thing that we have a strong and capable elephant in the Earl of Bronze, who apart from this will also be able to carry back a good amount of meals and medicine. So all in all, this mission definitely very much worth it. Back on the home tile, meanwhile, an exotic goods trader has arrived, and with that, I think it is time to bring an important chapter to its end. Yes, you have probably guessed it from the episode title already, but today is the day that we sell our bears, or at least most of them. To not be entirely unfair to the patrons who gave them their names, we are keeping the three youngest ones, so Level Boy, Cobalt and Jen will remain with Squigs and the Believers of Boyo, while it is time to say goodbye to Clay Brown, Matrix, Emily, Odarka, Marius, Chrono and Hexna. Now, selling these animals obviously makes us plenty of money. Money that we are now spending to purchase some Glitter World medicine and then the Psy Trainer for the Skip ability as well as for the Fast Skip ability and a Skill Trainer for the Crafting Skill. Skip should be immensely useful for Wyatt as a melee fighter, while Light should be able to utilize Fast Skip to good effect. This definitely increases the flexibility of our caravans quite a bit. We are then also exchanging the 34 elephant tusks we have assembled for a telescope, and with that we are now making the largest trade in the short history of this colony. Believe me, it was not an easy choice to make, but I think it's time for something new. The sacrifice of losing her bears then weighs heavily on Squigs, who at the moment is running around with a hefty minus 27 mood penalty, so once again we are using Kevin's counsel ability on her. This time, however, it is sadly unsuccessful, and so we only add a further minus 3 on top of all that. Recently released Grizzly Bear Hexna then immediately picks a fight with a panther, and at least she does the honorable thing and that's winning it, although with some help from her new owners. In the middle of the night then, a psychic sooth seeks out the jungle, and so at least for a few short days Squix's mood won't be quite as low as it could be. Still, on the following morning, as the caravan finally leaves again, we say goodbye to some furry friends. These bears have undoubtedly served us well, both in this series as well as in the last, but I think they just had to make room for something that could be even more glorious. An army of elephants definitely sounds very intriguing to me, but it remains to be seen how quickly we can assemble one. For today at least, just as the bears leave, another chance for charity arrives. Yes, it is another crashed escape pod survivor, and this one heavily injured. However, skill-wise, actually looking quite interesting. Yes, the incapability of skilled labor is a bit of a downside, but to make up for that we have passions, and mostly major ones, in pretty much everything else she can do, and that primarily includes the melee, animals and social skill. So I could very well see this person become the leader of an elephant trading caravan, but of course let's take things one step at a time. For now let's make sure that she does not bleed out on us, and then we can get her acquainted with our already somewhat impressive hospital. Yes, this is definitely the nicest room in our entire base, and who knows, maybe that is already enough to get her to stick around. One thing that I also noticed then is that her ideology is centered around the darkness meme, which would definitely be well suited for life underneath the mountain, but again, let's not get ahead of ourselves. 
And indeed, as she regains her ability to walk, the decision comes quickly. Looks like we won't have ourselves a caravan leader just yet, but she still decides to stick around a little while longer, at least until all of her injuries are fully healed. Shortly after then, our small caravan also arrives home. Our four successful adventurers walking across a field of fiery devastation, but they have brought back with them some valuable items, and I think we'll see about how exactly to utilize them in the next episode. For today, I think we have reached a good point to make the cut in this one. Not a whole lot of progress in terms of base expansion today, but it sure wasn't boring, and of course we have not even gotten to the fan art yet. This week I once again want to say thank you to Isaac Young who submitted a grand total of three drawings, one of Wyatt riding into war on the back of an elephant, another one of the maybe not so happy family of Took, Squigs and Ellie having breakfast, and a third of Kevin and Light sharing a bed during their plague, with Light hogging the blanket and Kevin having some violent thoughts as a result. In addition to all that, I also received a submission from Daniel over at the Stick Figure History YouTube channel. Just to add a bit of context, this one depicts last episode's prisoner escape scene, the one I talked about earlier, and uh, I guess I'll just let this one speak for itself. Oh, woe is me! How will we ever be able to redeem ourselves from the violence and blood we have spilled in the past? How can we find redemption when raiders and pirates constantly bring the violence to us? What will we- I can't stand it anymore! You people are crazy! You've kept me locked up inside this mountain for days! I need to get out! I I just want to go home. Please. Wait, wait, what are you? No, 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 and yes indeed, when will it ever end? A good question to end today's episode with. Once again, thank you to Isaac and Daniel. I am very much looking forward to what else we have coming up in the near future. Until then, I hope you enjoyed today's episode, and if you did, then I would be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up. And as always, if you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then you can of course subscribe to stay up to date and get notified when the next video goes up, grab some merch over on shop.peatcomplete.com, or get your name into the series too by supporting me over on Patreon. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.